Live from Dreber, this is the Lock Tomb Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Mel. We are here rereading Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Today we'll be covering Gideon the Ninth, chapters one through six, which covers everything from the beginning of the book up to when Gideon and Harrow arrive at the first house. I feel like when we say Tamsin Muir, we should say Her Majesty Tamsin Muir at all times. Yes. So we'll do that in the future, but hey, Amy, I have a, a quick question for you. What kind of trees do you think uh, they have on the ninth? What kind of trees, Mel? <laughs> Spine trees. Oh, you know, they have, you know, five <laughs> lumbar jacks on the ninth. Wow, that is painful. <laughs> I love it. You know, I had to look up like what a lumbar was or what that even meant to like yeah and it's actually you know fun bone fact for the day it's the region of the spine that is more commonly known as the lower back and there are five vertebrae that are part of it so when your lower back hurts that's like your lumbar region that makes sense because i have like a little pillow that i put in my car for my it's a, a lumbar pillow oh well there you go yeah. well, well. The more you know. There you go. So, because this is the first one, we're going to give a little context. Who are we? Who are these random people talking about the thirstiest characters in the history of fantasy? Truly. Really? And why are we doing it other than we're thirsty <laughs> for these characters? I would say, okay, like, I'm not sure if I would have loved these books as much as I do if it hadn't been the pandemic, but, like, I read Gideon and Harrow like the summer of 2020 and mm. they just kind of became as I sat alone in my house they just became my friends and I just loved the book so much and it was really a comfort and what was really a truly shitty time so it's true I feel like reading them during the pandemic was maybe the most appropriate time ever to read mm -hmm. these books it also allowed I mean I think it allowed both of us to read them several times yes you had enough time to just like really get yeah. hardcore into it. Mm -hmm. I think what you read, you read these books like seven, between seven and nine times each. I think I'm on my third <laughs> read through, but you really went hard. Mel, I, well, I've probably only read them like twice each, but I've listened to them. I think I've listened to Harrow, the audiobook, upwards of 10 times. And wow. Gideon, <laughs> probably like seven. You know, I'm not proud, but I also don't regret <laughs> it. <laughs> you kind of have to read them that much to really understand everything that's going on. The first time, I also listened to them twice. And so now I'm actually reading for the first time. And after the first go through, I think not even until three quarters of the way through Gideon did I have any sense of what was happening. And then even then, once I finished it, I still really didn't know. And then I just continued through Harrow and I still really wasn't totally sure. And it wasn't until the second listen through that I was like, okay, what I thought was happening actually is happening. Yes. I just thought it was so insane that maybe I was getting something wrong. Yeah, no, I feel totally the same. And on that note, we're not going to really try and keep this podcast spoiler free at all. If you're listening to this and you haven't read Harrow or get or sorry if you hadn't haven't read Gideon or Harrow you probably I mean unless you're like me and you read the end of the book before you even start a book <gasps> I'm sorry I do did you do that with these I think I knew some really key like plot points from Gideon wow from the end wow wow show anyway um if you are here and you are reading Gideon the ninth for the first time the, it may be better for you just to go read that book. Trust Tamsin Muir. She's a genius. Mm -hmm. She'll take you on a wild ride. Then read Harrow. And then come back to us. Yep. On your second read through. Yeah. These books are not for the new fantasy reader. Truly. If you, I feel like... If you haven't read any fantasy, go, you know, warm up with some Harry Potter. Those books are easy, <laughs> you know, to follow and are very much outdated and not as well written as these, but it at least gives you some sense of all the different things you're going to have to pay attention to and follow in fantasy. And then maybe go read some N.K. Jemisin, you know, get like 
leveled up in your fantasy oh reading where you really have to like pay attention and follow and then read N.K. Jemison again, like go back and read that again. <laughs> then come to Tamsin Muir because this sh- this shit is <laughs> bananas. And you have to like really know what to pay attention to when you're reading these books. Yeah. And I've really found that they were so great the first time. They're such a joy to read the second, third, fourth, whatever time. Because you just, (laughs) you catch more and more. And I also feel like there are certain jokes in Gideon and Harrow that like literally you could not understand unless you've read them already. Totally. Which, so they really do lend themselves to be read at least twice i mean at least yeah at or least. i mean or 10 times yeah you probably always find something new and a new little easter egg in there every single time you go through oh easily know? easily and then you're like wow that was so freaking brilliant yeah <laughs> she's smart hmm. tim's and you're smart brilliant this is the beautiful truth. writer <laughs> beautiful writer really creates the best characters i've ever gotten to know yeah super over the top but still i mean just built to delight us i think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) so should we talk about what we're going to talk about today yeah let's jump right in we're going to do a little short summary just to kind of place you within the book so that you know what we're going to be talking about and then we'll kind of go through beat by beat and probably just ramble about what we noticed and what we love about each little section with probably some tie-ins to later books. So we'll try not to be like ridiculously spoilery, but there will be a lot of spoilers throughout. All right. Short summary. So this is the bit. It's the very beginning. We were all here once. It was (laughs) very confusing. We had no idea what was going on. But this is technically what happens in this bit. Gideon, Nav, tries to escape the ninth house. What is the ninth house? We don't know. Harrow stops her violently and makes her attend a house muster where Harrow reveals that she has been summoned to attempt to attain lictorhood at the first house. Harrow's cavalier Ortis steals Gideon's shuttle, which she was going to escape on, and Harrow then convinces Gideon to join her as a replacement cavalier, and they leave the ninth house together. So that's where we're at. (laughs) Woo! I will say... Before the book even starts, there's a Dramatis Persona, which I, the first time I listened to this book, well, I listened to it. I didn't read it. So I didn't have the Dramatis Persona like on hand and it would have been really useful because the names are completely whack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like really, apparently Tamsin Muir really wanted to have the names have the same number of syllables as the house they were from. Whoa, but she just I did not catch that. She couldn't make it happen. Like Harrow, Hark, Nona, Jezza, Miss is still only <laughs> eight syllables. So I think she's off by a bit. But I think that's why they kind of got it. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like for anyone kind of who's doing this for the first time, I think the audio is so good. And it, it's mm. really useful because these names are hard to pronounce. Yeah. Like I, when I'm, I'm reading it now and I'm like, I'm so glad that I had Moira Quirk, like talk me through these first couple books because. Ugh, yeah. What a queen. She's so I good. Could, she's so good. And it really, I feel like her voice acting really lends itself to each character. Like you really get to know the characters, even through how she does her voice acting. Mm-hmm. It is like, The most beautiful, coolest listen ever. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you're kind of like, is this the same narrator? Yes, it is. She's just brilliantly like creating these characters through her voice. And it's amazing. But I will say that if you're listening to it, it's useful to also have the hard copy so you can go and read the stuff in the back. So you have that context and it's like just Mm -hmm. really useful. Yeah, yeah. I highly recommend having every form of this book on hand. Audiobook, <laughs> physical book, hardcover, soft cover, maybe an ebook so you can look things up quickly. <laughs> oh boy. Yes. So we have the dr- dramatis persona. It honestly, if you're reading it for the first time, it would make no sense 
because it's just a bunch of very weird names and Mm -hmm. references to houses and things that are just completely who knows. And then we're thrown right in. Like right in. There's no world building. There's no nothing. It's just all of a sudden it's fully in the middle of of the story. Gideon is um trying to leave the ninth house. Oh, another note, I was thinking about this. The very first line of the book is something about the myriadic myriadic year of our Lord or whatever. Ten thousand years. Ten thousand years is like mm. a long time to like have an empire really really a longer time than i think most empires we're familiar with i mean much on more our planet <laughs> rome was like you what, know a couple hundred years a couple hundred yeah i uh, yeah this ten thousand years that was the end of the ice age like oh my god we, we were like fully cavemen that's where we were at 10,000 years ago. You really have to adjust your relationship to time when you're reading these. And I, <laughs> yes. I feel like it makes it that much more dramatic. I mean, these books are so dramatic. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we're talking in like 10,000 year increments here, because there was also shit that went down before those 10,000 years. Yeah. You know, like we find out later how much world building Tams and Muir actually does like pre 10,000 years. Uh-huh. And so like we're working on a totally different timeline than what we're used to. And you have to like adjust that to really understand how intense this entire system is. Yeah. And at this point, like you have no idea, like you have no context for like where we are or what. And I guess we, I don't even know at what point it would be spoilery because it's never actually, we never actually, it never says like, this is what the ninth house is. But like by the end, I think you can infer. You get a sense. Yeah, what, and you what know what I still don't understand is like the shape of of the ninth. What is it really? You know, like well, it's. Can I say this? I don't know if I can say I think this. You, it's Pluto. Maybe just try. Is it? It's Pluto. I was thinking maybe it was. I guess it is a dead planet. Yeah, each of the houses <laughs> is one of the planets in our solar system. And you can kind of figure out, like, which is which by, like, different context clues in the books. But I think Ninth House is basically a drill shaft drilled into Pluto, like, in, like, our Pluto. And um, that's, that's what the house is. I wow. think. It's, impl- I, it's implied. It's definitely tiny, you know. As far yeah. as planets go, mm-hmm. it's small, desolate, miserable, yeah. cold. Yeah, because we definitely know, like, some things, like, we know the first house is Earth. And we know, like, some of these other houses are are other planets in our solar system. So I assumed that the ninth house is Pluto, although I'm not 100% sure. Inspired by planets in our solar system? Because I actually, th- I did not pick up on that at all. In my mind, this was not at all related to our solar system. But now that you're saying it, I'm like... You're right. I need yeah. to go back now and read it all again, which I am doing. Perfect. But this is what I'm talking about. There are always things that you discover whatever number of time you're going through these mm-hmm. books. It is amazing. <sighs> yeah, we can talk more about like what planets are which houses uh, at a later. I know the exact yeah. like yeah, yeah. moment where I was like, oh, my God, this is this is our solar system. Mm. But we can talk about that later. Anyway, that's where we're at. We're 10,000 years into the reign of our Lord the Emperor on the Ninth House, which is, as far as we know, a drill shaft in a thing. Who knows? It's cold. We have very little context. Very little context. (laughs) Gideon, also very first paragraph, Gideon takes her dirty magazines. Uh. Love it. Love it. That's. I think I fell in love with Gideon on page one yeah. of this book. There was no, like, let me build up into loving this character. It was like, Tamsin Muir wants you to love Gideon immediately and succeeds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she packs her stuff. She heads up. Um, she goes to her mother's, uh, I guess, uh, niche, like, tomb, even though her mother is not there. No context given for that. She goes up to the landing field where the shuttle is going to come and pick her up and take her off planet and then she's confronted by marshall crux who is a gross man 
Gross man. <laughs> but who Ugh. truly delights me. <laughs> You said that, and I'm like, Cruxa, actually, I I would like to write Crux out of this. Oh if there's God. one character that I am so icked out by, it's Crux. And again, the way ta- um the way Moira Quirk, mm-hmm. like, the voice that she puts on for Crux is, like, so perfect and disgusting. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it... I feel like that just turned me off immediately from Crux. I was like, this is disgusting. Oh, this God. Agree to disagree. I love <laughs> Crux. <laughs> Mostly I love how much, like, at the end of the day, he really is just a butt of a lot of jokes. Like, uh, That's true. Gives us a lot of comic <laughs> relief here. Yeah, he's just a funny guy. But he's also pretty rude. Gideon, I mean, he leaves eventually. I Iglamine shows up, who is the sword master i it's you know hard to say and gideon is a bit of a bit of a twerp to her and refuses again to come down to the muster call in drearber which is we kind of infer later is like sort of the central like castle structure within Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the the ninth house where like the family like the main family lives I mean, there's a lot of tension here. Like, I was getting stressed out at this point, which, again, is, like, immediately, Mm -hmm. where there's this countdown, right? And you're like, you know something is going to happen. And, again, Uh the way this is written is so good because it's already building up to some tiny climax that you're not sure about. And you don't know Gideon at all, but you want Gideon to get off. Of the ninth oh, house. Yeah. Immediately. You don't know what the ninth house is. You don't know anything, but you're like, no, I want this person to get out of here. Yeah, seriously. Take your pornography and get. <laughs> 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 yeah, you really do want her to go. Randomly, after I glamine leaves, I think this is the bit where we have some very quick, like, flashback backstory mm-hmm. on Gideon's origins. Yep. This is so mysterious, the first read through it's talking about how gideon's mother basically parachuted in to the drill shaft of the ninth house like brain dead from loss of oxygen yeah because all of the oxygen had been redirected to gideon who was a day old and they never figured out like who this woman was and who gideon was and the reason they named gideon gideon is that when they finally like called Gideon's mom back enough to like speak she just yelled Gideon three times <laughs> and like ran away but anyway Gideon's mom is no longer there is like so much that you learn <laughs> in that flashback and that's like rare there... for Tamsin Muir yeah and I and I think like there's reference to a lot of different things I think that the first read through you can really gloss over that you're like oh important backstory but mm-hmm. like you don't realize how central that backstory is to the whole rest of it. And the the brilliance of Tamsin Muir's writing here is there's such a deep understanding of trauma and family systems. Mm-hmm. And you can, you just see that in this first little glimpse, Tamsin Muir is giving you just a glimpse into the very early bits of how incredible her build out of these characters really are Mm -hmm. right this like deep understanding of where they came from where their parents came from and how that has made them who they are this like quick flashback into this story of Gideon's parent dropping down being dead calling Gideon's name three times is like a brilliant little clue into a lot of what we're what we learn in the future and i just think that's so beautiful the other thing i will say when i was listening to this for the first time was i'm imagining a baby surviving that and Mm -hmm. just being like this is not possible like and i wasn't sure about the physics of the world or how the world worked or anything that tamsin muir was building and again you just have to put your trust into the writing of this book and be like, I feel like that's not possible. And then later you figure out like why that was possible. And it's totally again, beautiful piece of writing and a lot of little clues that you get leading in. I think this is the first place where we learn that 
every single person in Gideon's generation is dead? Which yep. is kind of like a wild drop. <laughs> it is a wild <laughs> drop. And again, I didn't fully comprehend that when I first read it. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, everyone's dead. Yeah. It'd be deep. <laughs> no, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. Huge, huge, huge. Reference to the flu, right? Or some sort yeah. of sickness that took everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, a big drop there. Also, I... It, you know, a couple times into reading this, I remember that it mentions the prison. So the way, like the ninth house is like a drill shaft, like, or like it's a, I think it's like drilled into the planet, which may or may not be Pluto, who knows. And <laughs> in the atmosphere, like the pumped up, pumped out atmosphere, there's a prison complex, like, and that's where like the worst criminals of the nine houses go. And I think it's such a random thing to mention because you don't really, it doesn't really ever come up again except once in Harrow the Ninth, but like just kind of in a passing way. But I do wonder if it will play a part in the last two books of the series or if it's just like kind of a random thing that that isn't actually going to play a part. But there is like a prison complex. There is nothing random there is nothing random about this writing. That's what I thought. I was kind of like, why are you talking about this prison in the atmosphere and then never mentioning it again, except for, I think God calls it a, the dummy target in the atmosphere. In the, like, I don't know if that means that it was supposed to be sort of like a misdirect. Right. Anyway, that's just there. Who knows? Yeah. It's funny because before we were preparing for this, I didn't even remember that. Yeah, well, so, it's kind of you don't. It, it's not. It, it's not presented as important, but it's mentioned twice, and I just. Right. I don't know. I think I just want to feel smart if it does come into play later. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I and again, there is nothing random about this writing, and so every little thing will come up it just will we don't know and its level of significance will vary but there's nothing that is dropped in there for fun i mean well there are things that are dropped in for fun but like something like that is definitely i feel like it will get revisited especially since it was also mentioned in harrow yeah then can we just get to it like then yeah then the most important thing happens that's going to happen in this book. The most important I thing. Well, it's the most yeah. important meeting. Agreed. It's that Harrowhark, Nona Jesimus, reverend daughter of the Ninth House, shows up on the landing platform to confront Gideon. And the way it goes down is like so, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's just so ridiculous, honestly. <laughs> this is, this is... It is absurd. And I remember when I was listening the first time, I think I had to re-listen because I was like, is this actually happening? Like, am I reading this correctly? <laughs> I mean, this is something that happens to me throughout the entire series. Yeah. But you meet Harrow and you meet Harrow in this interaction that she has with Gideon. And it is such a good first interaction for us to bear witness to because it really gives you... The dynamic of the relationship. Yeah. And the relationship is really fucked up. And I think that's what I had a hard time reading at first. I was like, is this relationship really fucked up or am I reading this wrong? And no, yeah. then you go listen to it again and you're like, oh, no, that it's weird. It is weird. And so you you get to know so much about these characters. And I sometimes feel like Tansy Muir was just like, OK, these are some things that like I just want to see happen because I'm so gay and I just like need this in my life and so she just creates situations where just <laughs> anyway we can, we can go into this more later but this is what happens Harrow challenges Gideon to a duel and if she wins she can if, if Gideon wins she can leave right then with an officer's commission signed by Harrow but if Harrow wins Gideon has to come to the muster call in Jirber and then leaves afterwards on the same shuttle with the same commission so it sounds like kind of a win-win but and here 
Right. Here you know something is up because mm-hmm. Hero like loses no matter what. And what you get from the sense of like when this is starting is like Harrow doesn't lose, right? Like we learn that Gideon has tried to escape the ninth house, like what, 37 times or something? Yeah, something ridiculous. And so you already know that something is like up with all of this. Right. Harrow never sets herself up to lose, which I guess we don't know at that point. No, but you know that there's a power dynamic here, oh, right? Yeah. We know Gideon we know Gideon is an indentured servant and mm-hmm. we know that Harrow is the reverend daughter, whatever that means. Harrow seems to be in charge mm-hmm. of the ninth house, or at least like a very powerful player. And we know this because Crux and Iglamity are so appalled by the fact that Gideon would ever enter into a duel with Harrow, even though Harrow's the one who is, like, instigating the duel. Right. Right? And so you know that everyone basically is, like, Harrow is our leader, right? There, No one should challenge Harrow, who is supposedly in charge of the house. Yeah. Right? And so you see this, like, really messed up power dynamic that is also confusing. Again, you know something is up because it's, like, Harrow has all the power in the world, and it, what what was really confusing to me in this was that Gideon was willing to entertain the duel with like five minutes left yeah. of getting on that shuttle. Right. I was kind of like, when I was reading it again, I was like, come on, Gideon, you should know better than this. But she had already sort of like searched the whole area for, for we basically find out later, she's searching it for bone fragments and didn't find any. So she thinks she's safe. She thinks that, that Hera doesn't have any bonely accoutrement and so she enters into this duel thinking that it's basically her like an epic swordswoman versus harrow who's like this tiny twig with no muscles yep but it turns up out actually and like not very surprisingly that harrow stayed up all night uh digging tiny little (laughs) holes in the drill shaft dirt to hide little bits of bone so that when gideon engages her in this duel she turns all these little bone pieces into full skeletons and like wins the duel basically (laughs) this blew my mind (laughs) when i read it because again like you have no idea what's going on and you don't know how necromancy works at this point either Mm -hmm. like if you if you're not familiar with like necromancy in gent like writ large as an idea Mm -hmm. right like, you really don't know what's going on here. But what you do know at the bare minimum is that this hunky, kind of not super bright in this moment, like, Gideon, who is, like, jacked and, like, good with the sword, gets totally owned by some tiny little thing yeah. who has a lot of power and, like, dug a bunch of put a bunch of bones in the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And so you are, you also see, and again, this is why the beginning of this book is so good, because while you don't get oriented to the world, you learn about it pretty quickly through these, like, interactions and through, like, it's not even, like, a description of where they are. It's literally, like, the actions that each of these characters take can really just build that world for you really mm-hmm. fast. And so you get your first real glimpse at neck necromancy in this scene and you can see how powerful harrow is in this moment in that like armed with nothing but bones is able to just totally put gideon back in her place yeah it it is such a like violent fight too (laughs) so violent and then carol kicks gideon in the face wait but let's go back to their conversation really quick beforehand Yeah. yeah because it really does, like, people talk a lot or, like, there have been a lot of discussions about this relationship. And, like, some people are were not pleased with it because it is mm-hmm. obviously, like, a pretty toxic relationship. At minimum. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, Eval, I I'm not sure we should, like, be avoiding writing about toxic relationships anyway. I agree. But also, like on second read like you you can really see here that actually the most like the worst thing that harrow says during this whole exchange is that 
what does she say? She says, I don't even remember about you most of the time. Ooh. Yeah. And the first time through, you'd be like, oh, that you wouldn't even notice that. But but mm-hmm. later, you're like, that is definitely the cruelest thing that Harrow could say to Gideon because they're so enmeshed and like so in each other's pockets. Like they just, they're so... <laughs> They're very, they care very much about the other person's attention, you know? Right. And you miss, again, like what we talked about, this reference to this mass death Mm -hmm. that happened. What you miss the first time through is that they are the only two people of their generation on this planet. Yeah. And so if you really think hard about that, even if these two have this incredibly adversarial relationship as it seems and there's like a really messed up power dynamic the toxicity comes with like they hate each other and they're all each other have yeah and and you you don't necessarily get that right away on first read but you really internalize that as the books go on Uh uh-huh and so for harrow to say i don't even think of you most of the time is like the most painful thing that can be said to Gideon and Harrow knows that. Yeah. It's so cruel. It's so cruel. Yeah. And she says this again in the books later and then yeah, there are a couple of references basically like any time that that Harrow says something to this effect like I don't think about you or you're, you're not important to me. Like that's where you really see like that's like her at her most cruel. It's not her like beating up Hera or beating up Gideon or like, you know, doing all the other weird stuff she does. But when she tells Gideon that she doesn't think about Gideon, oh, brutal. Brutal. All right. Well, Gideon loses this duel. Yeah. Crux is delighted by that. this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so funny. I love Crux. Um, Crux fully drags her down into Drearbur. It's so violent. Yeah, she full on passes out from hitting her head at some point. It was just like it's very physical. Doesn't seem gratuitous to me. I don't I think it I just it is what it is. Uh and you get used to it over time, but there's a lot of like body yeah. horror and like sort of over the top body stuff in these books, but that's kind of the point. So Yep. So Gideon wakes up from passing out in Drearber, which is kind of this like big cathedral. Because Here's the thing about Tanzimir. She's so Catholic. Like, these books are just the so most, Catholic. like, they they have so many references to biblical stuff, but then also just the aesthetic is, like, very Catholic, which is really mm-hmm. interesting. The indoctrination. Just the architecture also, like, or, like, the this church is set up as, like, a Catholic church would be, basically. Mm-hmm. The pews. Yeah, the, well, I don't know all the words. I've major protestant kid but um it's it's a really cool aesthetic Gideon wakes up harrow is introducing or she's she's talking about the fact that she got a letter from the emperor this is really like the first time we're we're learning a little bit more about the emperor and the emperor is inviting her and her cavalier primary whose name is ordis (laughs) to come to the first house where they will attempt to become or Hera will attempt to become a lictor and it's implied that lictors are sort of the right hand people to the emperor also immortal and also very powerful so Mm -hmm. (laughs) we also learn in this moment that Hera's parents are fully dead they're there at the muster call like present and accounted for but they are actually dead and harrow's been using magic to puppet them for like five years or something (laughs) uh that's another big drop yep and this is another one of those moments these are another one Mm -hmm. of those moments where i had to reread it because you also again this is for those of us who are not as familiar with necromancy you're like, what does this mean that Harrow is puppeting them? Yeah. But that is literally what's happening here is that there's nothing to her parents other than their bodies. Uh-huh. And Harrow, by whatever power that we still don't fully understand yet, makes them appear to everyone that they are alive. And there's a big question for me here on like whether everyone actually believes that or not. 
And like we we learn how powerful of a necromancer Harrow is. And as part of like the theme of delusion throughout this whole series, I also kind of wonder if people know and they just don't want to see it. And that's kind of what's going on here. It's like a combination of how powerful Harrow is and how de- like delusional everyone else is too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really know. It I mean in the book it says that only Gideon, Crux, Iglamine and Harrow know that Harrow's parents are dead. But then mm, I don't know if it says but I think also Glorica, Ortis's mom also probably knows cuz her husband what is it, Mortis? He Mortis. died. <laughs> yeah. And I I don't know. I something tells me that like the folks who live in the ninth house are a little bit like not the most observant they just are going about their business and they love they really like worship harrow and her family so right we got a couple of interesting moments there at the muster cal we're set up with the lichterhood idea and we learn that harrow is basically fully in charge of the ninth house since her parents are dead after the muster call gideon uh tries to leave on the shuttle and it Turns out that Ortis and Glorica nicked it and have left um, on her shuttle. And Harrow follows Gideon to the landing field to watch her, like, get her heart broken over the fact that the shuttle is gone, which is truly fucked. (laughs) And tells Gideon that she hates her. And then that's that. Gideon is, has her escape plan has failed. Her escape attempt has failed, number 37 or whatever. And then instead of being extra motivated to try again, she gets the depression, which every time I read that line... (laughs) I love that she gets the depression. (laughs) Uh, So Gideon just like eats like nutrient paste and like does sit-ups in her cell. As we all do when we get the depression. (laughs) Um, For a couple of days. And then Harrow comes and gets her. Honestly, when I get the depression, I do not do (laughs) sit-ups. I probably would eat nutrient paste. Right. I feel like Gideon's coping strategy for getting the depression is actually like pretty good. <laughs> um, I want to go back to like some of the scenes mm-hmm. in this. There's there's so much humor here when they're at the muster call. Yes. There is, oh, my like, God. A priest <laughs> who literally dies. And the way that it is described is so like darkly funny where There's this moment where that priest has a heart attack. Everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. And then they realize, like, no, he's dead. And Gideon looks over to Harrow. And Gideon assumes, and again, another little Easter egg here, that Harrow is making a calculation in her head of what that means for the, the actual population of the ninth house. And it's like, that was, like, the first thought, you know, that Gideon assumes Harrow is having. And it is also... Probably the thought that Harrow is having. And he, and again, it's like a little Easter egg in there for us to understand the dire yeah. situation of the ninth house. And then the other thing that I find really fun here, like another little Easter egg, is when Glorica is making a huge scene, Ugh. which, by the way, again... To listen to the audiobook and the narration is like really fun. Oh my gosh, here, yes. The way that the voice acting happens. Crux is insulting Glorica and is like, you know, this is what comes of Mortis, right? Her dead husband marrying an immigrant eighth, you shameful hag. <laughs> and it is, it is, uh. you don't really understand that. Like, because you don't know any of the houses yet. Mm-hmm. It's very confusing. You think of, I mean, Crux is being an asshole here for sure. Uh-huh. And this is another like clue to what the relationship between the eighth and the ninth are. And again, you don't like learn that until much later, but it's fun to go back and read this because you actually understand the insult a little bit later. Mm-hmm. You understand why Crux has that like prejudice towards the eighth. The eighth sucks. Um, so again, it just. <laughs> Really beautiful, like, weaving in of all of these stories, again, being dropped in to the world and not really knowing, but being given all these hints is just what makes it such a fun read. Yeah. 
I also love that when that guy dies, I think the line is something like, and they all celebrated his sacred good fortune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, uh, I love Tamsin here. <laughs> so funny. Uh, so funny. Yeah. It's a, it's a great muster call. Wish I could have attended myself. <laughs> So where are we where are we now? Oh, Harrow. We are all right. So yes, <laughs> Gideon watches the shuttle. Get, and here, actually, I want to stop here because I didn't understand this when I first read it through. And so again, who is going in the shuttle? Right? Like, why did the shuttle leave? And it's you can see how um, foxy harrow is here yeah and it all i almost it seems like the whole thing was planned it seems like harrow knew glorica would object and then sends glorica and ortis into the shuttle right they leave and gideon is left and that is how harrow gets rid of the shuttle Mm. because otherwise gideon has all the paperwork and there's really no way out of this for harrow and yet harrow still figures out how to circumvent all of all of how to thwart all of Gideon's plans here and so it's Ortis and his mother who go into the shuttle and lift off which makes it possible for Gideon to again be stuck on the night yeah (laughs) Hera was very smart Gideon as we come to know is smart in her own way but most of her brain matter is in her biceps indeed and that's Mm -hmm. fine we love we love that we all have our own strengths (laughs) (laughs) Gideon has hers. So Hera lets Gideon mope for like a week and then comes and gets her basically by throwing a bone earring into her cell and turning it into into like a skeletal hand to unlock her cell. And (laughs) I love the idea. I think Tamsin describes it as Gideon tries to like leap for it to like throw it back as you would a grenade. (laughs) And I love the thought of like just a little bone fragment from Harrow is basically a grenade. Like, yeah, this tiny little bit of bone can turn into whatever she wants. I, it's just so great. Harrow makes uh, Gideon come down to the catacombs, which presumably are like below Jerber. Iglamine is there looking for swords and weapons among like the dead scions of the ninth house and we learn that Hera's grand plan is to replace Ortis with Gideon when she goes to the first house and this is this is another question I have about Mm -hmm. getting to this point is that was this Hera's plan all along was to have once Hera received that letter from the emperor was was it Hera's plan all along to have Gideon be her cavalier I think so, because I think, doesn't she say later that the plan was to have Ortis escape on the shuttle and then be brought back a couple days later in disgrace? You're right. Indeed. So I think that, like, I don't know how spur of the moment it was, and it is weird, but I mean, she does know that Gideon's a good swordswoman, like, so I guess maybe she does appreciate that enough to, like, want Gideon to come. She also doesn't like Ortis. So it's not like she's, it's like Gideon versus someone she likes. It's like (laughs) two people Harrow hates. (laughs) And she decides to take the one who's hot Hot. and can wield the sword. Yep, hot. (laughs) I mean, same girl. the hot one. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Yeah. A couple things about the scene. Eoval, first meme of the book, I think. I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure this is our first meme alert. If you did, if you if you have not noticed this in these, but I mean, there's a good chance that many people out there would not pick up on these references to like memes from 2016, which is like what they all are. But I picked up on some, and then I found more online that people had found. I did, I did notice this one. I don't think the first time I read through, but at some point, <laughs> Tamsin loves to put these like internet memes, like references to internet memes in these books. And they're totally, like, it turns them into, like, a weird time capsule because all of these memes are, like, old now. Like, they're f- they're from a while ago. So this one specifically is, Iglamine is discussing how long it would take Gideon to learn to use a rapier. And Harrow says, oh, nonsense. 
She's a genius. With the proper motivation, Griddle could wield two swords in each hand and one in her mouth. While we were developing common sense, she studied the blade. And if you've never seen this study, if you've never seen the I studied the blade meme, I mean, just go look it up. It's that's it's a reference to this meme and it's truly very funny. That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> um, I'll try and point out other memes as we go. I know some people don't like them because they can kind of take you out of the moment, but I find them absolutely delightful. Another thing that a couple of times into reading this book, I noticed and I was like, oh, I didn't like I wonder what this is referring to is I Glamine has this moment once so Gideon's kind of been convinced to do this because really it's her only way off planet. And I guess, you know, desperate times. So Iglamine says, Hera leaves the room. Iglamine comes to Gideon and says, after much thought, says, things are changing. I used to think we were waiting for something. And now I just think we're waiting to die. And it, like, I don't really know what she's referring to, but it does seem like pretty portentous. Yeah. Like, it's yeah it's like here's what's curious about that comment is like it has been so horrible on the ninth house for many 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 years right this is all i glamony has ever known right yeah and what changed you know again you think about tamsin muir as a writer and how intentional she is with the character development and the backstory she probably has a backstory for i glamony that we don't even know about and so what changed for Iglamony there to go from one thing to now I think we're waiting to die? That something had to have happened. And again, yeah. I don't know what this is referring to, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Iglamony, did, if Iglamony doesn't come back at some point in this series and we find out. Yeah, I also, I also have no, it could just be, I don't think it could be just offhand because Tanzania Muir just doesn't do off ta- offhand. Right. But I do wonder if it's later on, I won't say what character, but a character says something's gone terribly wrong in the river and I wish you'd find out what. And the river we find out, you know, in later books is kind of like this. Purgatory. Sort of like after, yeah, like this weird afterworld thing. And I just wonder if, like, there is, like, something has gone wrong and, like, in the last, you know, however long, in the last 20 years, 100 years, but that that I glamine can sense this. I don't know. Or maybe she's just a smart lady who, like, has good instincts. Yeah. I, I, think, I think there's something more. And, again, I don't know what it is. And that's so much of this book is, like, you think there's something here, but you're not quite sure what it is. Yeah. I think it's important, and we'll see. We will just have to see. Yeah. Ooh, so exciting. To finish this up, we once Gideon is convinced to do this with Harrow, she, there's like a little training montage, which, I mean, I love. <laughs> um, Gideon, Gideon gets, basically gets her ass kicked by a glamine because, I don't know if we've said this, yes, but Glid- Gideon, Glidian. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Um, Gideon uses a like a long sword like a heavy two-hander two-handed long sword and cavaliers traditionally use a rapier which as i don't know if you know this about female but i used to fence i did not know that about you <laughs> yeah and it was such a little it was such a funny thing it was in middle school anyway i can see tiny little <laughs> nerd amy fencing and thinking that you are in a fantasy book yourself oh 100 percent. anyway Gideon, like me, is not really all about the swinging around of these little tiny pokers, but is also just a talented athlete, basically. And Iglamine is able to sort of whip her into shape and get her to be at least decent with this rapier. It's also mentioned that Gideon drills like a hole in her suitcase so that she can hide her longsword in it, which is sick. It's sick. It's also, I I was trying to understand how that worked. <laughs> Like where yeah. in the suit? Where do you drill a hole in your suitcase to hide a long sword? Because arguably, this long sword is like pretty big and heavy. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that that it. She does it somehow. We get a really really funny scene where Harrow paints Gideon's face, 
Because the nuns of the locked tomb wear this like skull face paint, which is such a cool aesthetic, but also Gideon hates it and hasn't done it for a long time. But in order to pretend to be Hera's cavalier, she's going to have to wear this face paint, even if it gives her, as she says, pizza face. And what else? And Hera also is basically telling her nothing. Like, Gideon just sort of blindly going off. The only thing that Gideon overhears is that Harrow thinks it's going to be a competition. And this is the first moment I think that I realize that like, oh, this is going to be like a school story sort of. Yeah. Like it kind of becomes this like funny Goblet of Fire-esque weird. Oh God, great reference. <laughs> You know what I mean, though? It, Which I think and, is and, funny. Like, again, because the book, the books are not about, God, they're, I feel like the, how do I frame this? The competition is the least of the storylines in this book. But it right. provides the skeleton, if you will, nice. for, the. it's like the container of all the other important things that you're supposed to pay attention to. It is, Mm -hmm. I love the fact that a competition story in fantasy is kind of overdone. It's kind of boring. And you're Uh you're like, really, again, we're going to school. We're going to magic school. You know, like how many, it's a tired plot line. And yet, and again, I think intentionally, Tamsin Muir puts this like kind of overdone plot into place, right? This competition story or this framework. And it is so well done. It is so uh-huh. good and so creative and so different than anything I've ever read in fantasy and just shows the creativity and talent, right, of Tamsin Muir in being able to do that and follows with the theme of all these, like, dumb little things that Tamsin Muir, like, puts in there f- just for pure joy of herself because it's just fun uh-huh. to write and fun to read and, like, makes these books that are otherwise, like, really dark also just hilarious. They're so funny. You can tell she just had so much fun writing a lot of this, you know? And I also think that comes from her coming from the world of fan fiction. Like, it also, it reads like fan fiction, but also it's, it's like written in a way that like is irreverent and doesn't, she doesn't take herself too seriously, but she's also such a good writer. It's not a pretentious read. No. You know, It, it, it is like the opposite of a pretentious read. You just get how complex and well done the whole thing is. I I mm-hmm. want to come back because I'm curious about this. And Amy, maybe you're more tuned in. The moment where this rapier is chosen for mm-hmm. for Gideon is really important. <laughs> um, and mm-hmm. I I can't find where where it is. Right, the rate the this particular rapier is in an, is important. Period. Um, and I'm curious. Yeah, it's Ortis's great grandma, I think. Right. Okay, there we go. So it's his great great grandma's uh, something. It's it's basically uh, the the rapier of of one of Ortis's like ancestors, one of the previous cavaliers of the house. Right. Also, also, is this the place where um, Harrow says, like, in the most incredible moment of foreshadowing of all time, Harrow <laughs> says. Like threatens Gideon by saying that she'll mix bone meal in with her breakfast and punch her way through her gut. Holy shit! If wow. So yeah, that's a that that'll that'll come back. That is bananas. So basically, at the very end of chapter seven, Harrow and Gideon leave the house. They get on a shuttle. Chapter and, six. Um, at the end of chapter. Six. Oh, chapter six. Yeah. Get on a shuttle and head out and. <laughs> they leave the ninth house behind and it's it happens pretty quickly it's a pretty emotional moment for gideon we see like a little bit of vulnerability here which and for harrow i would say that's true that's true say what you will about harrow she loves the ninth house right right but they're they're emotional for different reasons gideon mm-hmm. is emotional because she <laughs> will never have to go back to the ninth house again if everything goes well and harrow which again, we don't fully comprehend yet, has so much pressure. She is under so much pressure here and is both going to really miss this place that she's in charge of and Mm -hmm. feels so 
and is so connected to and Mm -hmm. the fate of the ninth house is really on her shoulders and has been but it's kind of all culminating in this moment where she's actually going off to become a lictor which in effect would supposedly what she thinks will like actually save the ninth house and restore the ninth house yeah yeah oh and also we should mention that like she does send crux down as you were saying before like she sent crux down to do something like like i think like around the tomb which is like why this i mean i guess we we do learn in these chapters that like the point of the ninth house there's a tomb on the ninth house that like that's what they are protecting or like that's why it's here it's and that's why this whole house exists and then yeah presume i guess she sends crux down to do something down beneath Dur- Durber. so he's up to something I, I don't we never really find out we don't know <laughs> but maybe we will in the future i want to talk a little bit about how old gideon and harrow are because that's oh, another th- brother that's another thing <laughs> we're unclear on but they're they're children yeah harrow's yeah we do learn how old harrow is because it says something about like gideon can't believe that you could live in the world only 17 years and right sneer with such blah 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 i right. don't remember the exact we, line we but. learn harrow is 17 <laughs> 17 17 17 years old and to be that cruel is i mean also though i feel like i was a huge dick at 17 that's, like in a way that i i would not be now like i was capable of cruelty in a way that i am not i like just want that's really true you also weren't in charge of a planet or <laughs> it's true like we're an all-powerful necromancer so it's like this is very it's both, true. It's like seventeen and angsty and cruel plus a lot of power. Yeah, and that equals a lot of violence here, mm-hmm. and it, and um, and desperation, also and desperation and lonely. You know all the things that you f- like. If you hearken back to how you felt when you were seventeen, which I don't really want to spend a lot of time on because no. <laughs> that was a sad, depressing, anxious time, angsty. So much drama when you're 17, but we also learn Gideon is two years, well, I don't know if we learn this in this section, but Gideon is two years older than Harrow. So Gideon's 19, right? They, they are kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the level of maturity and immaturity here, we see them really grow as characters throughout this series in a really you know, cool way. Um, Mm -hmm. But here you're seeing them at their worst. Yeah. It's like the worst versions of themselves are in these first few characters. Yeah. uh, First few chapters. Yeah. And we still love them. They're so little. Ugh. Babies. Mm Mm-hmm. So baby gays. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, they're also both so gay. (laughs) I think that was pretty immediately uh, apparent. Yeah. Frontline titties of the ninth. I mean, yeah, that's just... mm Mm-hmm. Gotta love that. Uh, what a great title. Of the title fifth, of, I think. I don't know the ninth uh, has very many frontline titties. Oh, yeah. Was it of the fifth? Yeah. You're right. It was, there would be a different kind of That'd be a different uh, vibe. <laughs> magazine if it were a ninth house porn, which I think I'm sure there there are. I guess. Um, I mean. But you see how horny Gideon is just from the beginning. This poor girl. <laughs> with, with no one to explore that with. No. It's so sad. <laughs> it's so sad. But, you know, as like a queer person, reading this is so fun because the queerness in it just is. Mm-hmm. And it's not, there's not a big deal. You know, there's, it's not a big deal. It just kind of is part of it and it runs in the background and it very much is who they are. And a huge part of this universe, right, is queerness. And yet it's not about queerness, but it also is. Uh, and it's so fun to read. And as I'm as I like fell in love with Gideon throughout this book, mm-hmm. I'm like, do am I into Gideon? Do I want to be Gideon? Yeah. Like, I'm not actually sure. And I still don't know. I definitely I definitely feel like I was into Gideon for a lot of this first. Book. Wow. OK. Um, just love, 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 love. A little doofy. Really strong, hot. Yeah. A little angsty. Definitely angsty. Hilarious. I just loved that Gideon had been through, and you get the more you get to know Gideon, the more you see this, like, she's been through so much, but she really is just still, like, a truly nice person. 
Yeah. Which is, it blows my mind. Like, Harrow, I, like, honestly, I mean, this will be for Harrow the Ninth, but I have, like, never related to a character as much as I relate to Harrow, the, to Harrow, but that's complicated in itself. But Gideon, I just feel like I knew her. I feel like we were friends. Like, yeah. it just felt really, like, I was in on the joke. And I loved that. <laughs> Oh, so anything else you want to say about these first couple chapters? I mean, it's it's funny because, like, it's important for setup, but they're definitely not, like, my favorite chapters. No. They're definitely a little bit – they're chaotic, and I, like, had no idea what was going on the first time. And people tell me this every time I give – every time I give someone this book and I, like, ask them, like, how it's going, so often they'll be like, I do – I'm so confused. Like – yeah. And it is, con- it's really confusing. <laughs> it's really it confusing. Is. It is. But you guys, it's so worth it. Uh, the payoff at the end is just beyond anything. I mean, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, it is worth it. I guess we probably don't have to, if you're listening to this podcast, we probably don't have to tell you that. <laughs> no, we don't have to tell you it's worth it. I mean, I do get really frustrated when I, you know, after I finished Harrow, I was craving more content. And so I would go on YouTube and I'd try and find anyone to be able to talk about this just so Uh I could have more. And I was frustrated by some of the folks who reviewed it because they, the review was basically like, this was so confusing. I didn't know what was going on. And I, I think, (laughs) no, (laughs) I, I get it. I get it. And you have to, they are meant to be read more than once. And, for a reader who is reading for pure enjoyment and not not a reader who's like just trying to bang out as many books as possible in a year you know like these books are meant to be read more than once they're meant to be read slowly you are meant to go back and look for things as something comes up and is like triggered for you Mm -hmm. you know like they are meant to be you are meant to have like a love affair with these books. Yeah, you're you know? meant to read the pool scene at least 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's fun to do. Like there's some books that you don't need to read more than once cuz it also wouldn't be fun, but it is if you want some prolonged enjoyment, you spend many hours with these books over and over again and they are they're just so good. Beloved characters. Yeah, they become your best friends. I know. <laughs> I'm so excited also. Next so next uh episode we'll be discussing the end of Act One and the beginning of Act Two of Gideon the Ninth. And oh man, all, we love Gideon and Harrow, obviously. Uh, you know, of course. But we're about to meet so we're about to meet teacher. We're about to meet teacher. Teacher. <laughs> teacher. <laughs> We're about to meet so many good characters. Ugh, the horrible fourth teens. Everyone. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm really pumped for this next episode because there's also so much for us to dig into mm-hmm. for our next episode. And yeah. Oh, man. We just meet so many awesome, awesome characters. And again... Another plug for going through and reading them again. Reading this next portion a second time is pure joy. I know. Oh, my God. Knowing knowing what you know to read how they interact when they first meet each other, you're like, oh, that's <laughs> what was going on here. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's really, really excellent. It's truly, It's truly a masterpiece. I can't wait. All right. Well, I think we can probably wrap it up there for today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're really excited (laughs) to be doing this. This has been so much fun uh, for us. I hope that you guys liked it. Uh, We've made a website and a Twitter. So we do really want to engage with anyone who loves these books as much as we do. Please feel free to visit our website, locktombpod.com or our Twitter at locktombpod. And, and you can send us, I mean, really anything. Anything. Like links to your fan art, your favorite fan fiction, questions about the book that are still keeping you up at night mm-hmm. or that you're confused about and you're like, what the hell is happening here? I've read this twice and I'm still <laughs> not sure. 
see if we know or see if we know someone who knows or we can, you know, tap the community and figure it out together. Your predictions and theories. Yes. Your fave bone oh jokes. My gosh. Your fave please, characters. <laughs> please send some bone jokes because I feel like Mel is really going to be struggling after a while to come up with some. I've really, <laughs> you know, given myself a hard challenge, but it's impressive. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, we would. We would really love to um, engage with the community. So send send your stuff over, and we'll see you next time at the Locktoon Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Mel, and we'll see you next time.